Good afternoon and welcome to this special webinar ahead of International Holocaust Day. I'm Uri Dromi, Director General of the Jerusalem Press Club. For those of you unfamiliar with our organization, we seek to provide journalists reporting about Israel and the region uh, with a nuanced perspective, connecting them with valuable sources coming from diverse backgrounds. Here at the club, we decided to take a break from the daily grind of uh, hard news and shift the agenda to an issue affecting our greater Jewish family, the coverage of anti-Semitism across the globe. Eight decades after the Holocaust, hatred of Jews has not vanished. Jews are still attacked in the streets, in New York and in Paris or in synagogues uh, for the crime of appearing Jewish. Anti-Semitism rears its ugly head during times of uh, military tension in Israel, the symbol of modern Jewish revival. Today, we pose the question of the media's role from perpetuating anti-Semitism online to seeking to report about the acts of hatred against the Jews during a point in history where other issues like global pandemic and political polarizations take precedence. The Jerusalem Press Club is honored to host four distinguished and experienced experts in the field of anti-Semitism and media to address this question. Uh, Dr. Nachman Shai, Minister of Diaspora Affairs, who will deliver a keynote speech. Uh, Danny Dayan, uh, Chairman of Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center. Carl Noel, Director of Anti-Defamation League in Israel. And Ben Dror Yemini, one of Israel's most prominent publicist from the Idiot Dr. Nachman Shai is, uh, has been called right now to a cabinet meeting, so he, he will join us later. And we'll start with uh, uh, Danny Dayan, chairman of Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remember Center. Dayan served as Israel's consul general in New York and previously served as chairman of the Yesha uh, Council, before that as chairman of the board and CEO of Elad Software System uh, Limited, a company he had founded. Uh, in addition, Diane Volunteers is the head of advisory board of Nefesh Benefesh. Uh, Mr. Diane, please, thanks for joining us and please. Thank you so much, Uri. Uh, in some, uh, to some extent, I will speak more as a former consul general to New York, Israel's consul general to New York, as chairman of Yad Vashem. So I will add a few things that are relevant, uh, extremely relevant to my current position. But you know, when I arrived to New York, it was uh, back in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2016, in August 2016, to serve as Consul General of Israel to New York, which is among other things, is the senior representative of the State of Israel to the Jewish community in America, basically, not, not only in New York, because the the headquarters of the national organizations, the Jewish national organizations are located in New York. So I believed, uh, probably I would say, I was naive enough to think that uh, um, anti-Semitism will not be high in my agenda. Uh, I will be even more sincere than that. Uh, and I hope uh, my good friend Carol will not uh, be angry at me and say that uh, even I uh, thought that there are Jewish organizations uh, that uh, use anti-Semitism an excuse for fundraising. Well, um, I was wrong. I was completely wrong. Um, um, what uh, uh, happened, uh, I must admit that in the first month of my tenure there, uh, that indeed was the situation. However, very quickly it changed. It changed gradually, it changed with uh, the desecration of cemeteries. I remember going to a cemetery, Jewish cemetery in the outskirts of Philadelphia that was desecrated and flying to Rochester, New York, and a swastika in this synagogue, in that synagogue. Uh, but nothing prepared me for Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville, Virginia was the, the first watershed moment of my term there, and I think in some senses of modern anti-Semitism in the United States of America. Uh, nothing is uh, the same before uh, uh, and after uh, Charlottesville when uh, the Nazi flag, uh, the, the most, uh, the symbol of uh, massacring Jews was waved uh, proudly without any interference uh, in the streets of an American city. 
A thing that, by the way, in most uh, European countries, obviously in Israel too, would be not only um, morally abhorrent, but also uh, criminally punishable. Um, but that was only the beginning, because then came uh, Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is de definitely is a, a, a dramatic event in which 11 Jews were killed but while praying on Shabbat morning in their synagogue in a quiet uh, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, in a quiet city in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I remember that uh, I, did, uh, I arrived to Pittsburgh when the that the same day when the bodies were still lying on the on the floor of the synagogue, and uh, no, it was not. No, it was the gravest, but not the only event that came Poway, California, uh, Jersey City, a kosher grocery in, in Jersey City, New Jersey, a Hanukkah celebration in uh, uh, Monsey, New York. All in all, uh, 15 Jews were murdered for being Jews in uh, less than two years in American soil. Um, we could believe the things that can can happen in in Europe, in France. Indeed, uh, eleven Jews were murdered in a decade. But here we have America, New Amer United States of America, fifteen Jews killed by in anti-Semitic attacks in less than two years. And as we knew, we saw recently, we saw recently in Texas, uh, uh, no one can guarantee us that, that those were the last uh, anti-Semitic events. Uh, what we see today in America, uh, and I speak about the United States because that is my field of, of expertise, although I was born in South America, uh, what we see now in, in, in uh, North America, mainly the United States, is a, a, a growing combination of four different types of anti-Semitism that have a fruitful uh, with quoting Marx's cooperation of fruitful synergy between them. The first one is the, what I would call the bare knuckle, the, 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 the gross uh, neo-Nazi anti-Semitism, white supremacist anti-Semitism, uh, like we saw in, in, in Pittsburgh and other places. Um, the, 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 the abhorrent, the, theories that the Jews are this and the Jews are that. And then came uh, uh, ideological uh, African-American anti-Semitism. We have to say it. Uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan is its main prophet. Uh, and also though the perpetrators of the killing in uh, Jersey City were uh, so-called uh, black Israelites, uh, which is a uh, uh, ideological anti-Semite uh, group, anti-Jewish anti-Semite group that, as we saw, as we saw there, was also extremely lethal. Uh, then there is um, and the, uh, I would say, the the hooligan anti-Semitism. Uh, it doesn't have an ideology, but uh, when they see a woman uh, with a uh, 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 Orthodox wig or, or a, a Jew with a, a, a Orthodox shtimel, uh, they beat him or they throw their hat uh, to the floor or they uh, shatter the window of uh, a distinctly Jewish shop, etc., etc. And the fourth one that I must admit that for the time being is the less lethal, but it's not less dangerous, is the anti Semitism that disguises itself as anti Zionism. And all those four are not are different manifestation of the same hatred, and they have synergy between them. The left takes ideas from the right, the right takes ideas from the left, and they join forces to kill Jews, to combat Jews, to, to desecrate the uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, houses of prayer, etc., etc. I will conclude by saying this: um, Israel doesn't have authority to act in America or in other places in the world. We don't have a police that can act there. We don't have an educational arm that can uh, uh, act freely there, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that we don't have uh, responsibility doesn't mean that we, the authority doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility. We do have responsibility as the Jewish state and our responsibility, which I do my, my, my 
a, a small part when I uh, host leaders in, in Yad Vashem, is to explain to them that anti-Semitism must be combated forcefully, decisively, and immediately, because we know what, our, what the world didn't know in the in, in 1930s. And that is that anti-Semitism can become a monster, cannot uh, acquire monstrous dimensions. I think it happened once, it can happen again. And the responsibility of leaders, of intellectuals, of, of, of journalists, if I may say, is to uh, confront this scourge immediately, forcibly, and decisively. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you later for follow-up and questions. Uh, Carol Noel uh, now is the director of the Anti-Defamation League in Israel, which she has worked for the last 20 years as part of a role at ADL. She engages in the struggle against anti-Semitism and delegitimization of Israel and leads efforts against hatred in the public and online spheres. Uh, Carol Noel has worked for the Israel Broadcasting Authority, the Foreign Ministry, and the Shalem Center. Thanks for joining us, Carol. I saw you nodding approvingly to many things that uh, Mr. Dayan said, but I'm sure you have your own uh, inputs here. Thank you, Ori. And indeed, Danny has firsthand experience um, as an Israeli who lived in the US for a couple of years and served the state of Israel. And I think he can attest to the change that we're seeing in the US, as, as, as he said before. I will try with your permission in the next couple of minutes to give a brief overview of where we are in terms of anti-Semitism worldwide, and then sh share some thoughts about what I think the role of the media should be in covering anti-Semitism. So I'd like to share with your permission five sort of insights about trends that we're seeing in anti-Semitism worldwide, not only in the US, but really um, globally. And, and First, let me just mention that the curve of anti-Semitism has been on the rise for many years. And I think that in the last three years, we're really seeing a peak in, in anti-Semitic incidents. And we don't have enough information about attitudes, but the, the information that we have about anti-Semitic attitudes really reaffirms the notion that people still hold anti-Semitic uh, attitudes in many places around the world. And we need to understand how deep-rooted anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic thinking is. And this is why this is what leads um, to anti-Semitic incidents and deeds. Um, but specifically this year, it, the year before 2021, with Operation Guardians of the World, we saw not only an increase in anti-Semitism online but also how it affected Jewish communities in the field. In a poll that we, the Anti-Defamation League that we did um, among US Jews, we found that 40%, 40% of Jews are more concerned to their personal safety than before they were, um, before um, Operation Guardians of the Wall. So it really affects Jews, the fact that they are identified automatically with the state of Israel and that um, they are targeted as Jews because of that is really something very, very significant. The second point that I wanna mention is the growing intensity and also not only intensity, but also severity of anti-Semitic incidents. So there's an increase in numbers and there's also um, an increase in the danger that anti-Semitism poses to Jewish communities and, Jew and individuals. So we saw it started 15 years ago with Ilan Halimi um, uh, in Paris, and then the Toulouse massacre, and then Brussels, and 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 then it clicked to the U.S. I mean, then we had Hipper Kasher, of course, and, and and Charlie Hebdo. But then, um, in the U.S., it really took us by surprise because we were all raised on the notion that that the U.S. is the safest place for Jews worldwide. And and you know what? It's still. I think this is still the case. U.S. is still a safe place for for Jews, but but not in the same way it used to be before. The fact that institutions need security, this is something that we didn't, you know, we didn't know in the past. So things are really changing, but, but we don't need to take it out of proportion. We have to keep it uh, very, very authentic to what's happening on the ground with the communities. The third point that I wanted to mention is the growing targeting, and that's true not only to Jews. We're seeing more targeting of synagogues, but also more targeting targeting of other houses of worship, churches, uh, mosques all over the world. And it shows us that extre extremists 
choose their um, targets very, very carefully and know that religion institutions, uh, religious institutions are very, very uh, vulnerable and very sensitive to many people. So we have also to focus on that point. And then for anti-Semitism, the flourishing of Holocaust revisionism, um, <clears throat> as well as anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. And in that respect, let's just take a look at what happened in Texas when the hostage taker uh, held an anti-Semitic um, theory about the power and influence of Jews. And he used that in order to gain, you know, to try to gain um, uh, some benefit from that and, and um, achieve what he wanted to achieve, the release of uh, a terrorist from the US prison. And then also um, we, we, we have to mention, I think, anti-Semitism online. So we need to be aware of the potential danger of anti-Semitism online, but we also have to, to, to push the, the platforms to uh, really take responsibility to monitor and to remove anti-Semitic content. Um, Ori, if I have two more minutes, I'll say a couple of words about the role of the media because I think it's important. It touches upon um, <clears throat> not only how we cover anti-Semitism. Okay, let's go for it. Before that, on how we look at anti-Semitism. First and foremost, and I believe that's true and that it applies to any coverage, be balanced and be impartial when covering anti-Semitic incidents. May, make sure you are sensitive culturally. And when covering Israel, even if the perspective is critical, which is OK, it is OK to be critical of Israel, make sure not to cross the line, not to cross the line to total delegitimization of the state of Israel. You can definitely be critical of policies. That's totally fine. But to cross the line to anti-Semitism and delegitimization of Israel is just wrong and unacceptable. <clears throat> Having said that, I do want to say that it's important not to create an impression that Jews are too sensitive to anti-Semitism. We, we all have to be very sensitive to hatred when, whenever it exists, including anti-Semitism. Um, <clears throat> And also, I think it's also important not to perpetuate stereotypes about communities you cover, whether they are Jews or non-Jews. Um, thirdly, and that's a point where we as ADL really focus on, not to frame the story of anti-Semitism as a story that relates only to Jews. Anti-Semitism is not about Jews, it's about the societies and the countries in which it exists. And as such, we have to fight these we have to fight it um, that way. And, and Danny, to your point, that's a responsibility of the countries in which Jews live. That's total responsibility and, and we can't ignore that. Okay. And then <clears throat> I think that lastly, I just wanna say one thing. We speak about a very ugly phenomenon, a very unique one, very ugly one. But I think at the same time, it's very important to be constructive and for all of us to highlight um, also the ways in which people successfully come together to fight anti-Semitism, find the constructive angle is very, very important as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Uh, our next speaker is Ben Yamini, one of Israel's mm -hmm. most prominent publicists, a columnist for Yediot Achonot, before that for Mariv. Uh, his writing is writing uh, and, uh, and uh, lectures and uh, public appearances deal with the the delegitimization of Israel, as well as other aspects of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, so, uh, Bendro, you you uh, have a lot of mileage in uh, in uh, combating uh, the phenomena. Please share with us your thought. Okay. Um, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I hope you see my uh, presentation. And uh, let me tell you that uh, first, I'm not optimistic because when we are uh, trying to see what happened in the, the last two decades, we have no reason to be optimistic. It's, uh, I'm afraid that it's going to be uh, much worse. And many times we are confused uh, and, and uh, we are criticized even. Oh, don't speak about it because actually uh, uh, what you do is that we Israelis, we uh, pro-Israelis, um, sometimes um, Jews, uh, whatever you are saying is uh, actually uh, because you don't want to hear criticism against Israel. And we know this kind of argument, uh, uh, repeatedly we hear it. 
it's not easy. Sometimes we have to admit it's not easy to make the distinction between uh, a legitimate criticism uh, and uh, and uh, demonization, which is part of uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, and I mean, there is a definition, the working definition uh, uh, of anti-Semitism. Uh, anti I guess we um, all know it. But I'm going to give you some examples. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have to say, I'm not sure that every example is a, a blatant anti-Semitism. But when it piles up, it is anti-Semitism. Um, let's begin. Uh, you will have to stop me because I have something like uh, not seven minutes, but seven hours of presentation. So uh, you have to give me. Unfortunately, a unfortunately, yeah. we, we we don't have the seven hours. Yeah, I know, I know. We have the I seven know. minutes. Yeah, I I uh, I'll do my best to be uh, as short as possible. Thank you. I'll give you. Thank I'll you. give you an example. The old when we are speaking about old anti-Semitism, there is according to so many research of uh, Je Professor Jeff Hafri and uh, and others. The, the main the main lie the big lie as uh, it is called in the research uh, is that the Jew is the great danger to humanity. It has been uh, uh, said in the thirties again and again. Uh, people were brainwashed with this kind of Jews are the great danger to humanity. It's very interesting because uh, when we are going to nowadays, we see uh, someone like Arun Gandhi. Yes, he is a grandson of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And he published an article claiming that we have created a culture of violence. Israel and the Jews, Israel and the Jews, he does not even distinguish between Israel and the Jews, are the biggest players. And that culture is eventually going to destroy humanity. Actually, the same idea, old anti-Semitism and new uh, anti-Semitism. And it's going on. I must admit that uh, for me, it was my uh, uh, first encounter with, with uh, uh, an Israeli Jewish anti-Semitism. I have no other definition. I, uh, uh, it's, from, it's coming from 2002. I read an article in a very prestigious uh, magazine, uh, London Review of Books, uh, and, and uh, a paragraph claimed that gas chambers are not the only way to destroy a nation, gas chambers. It's enough to develop high rates of infant mortality, meaning that's what this is what we in Israel are doing to the Palestinians. We are sophisticated, so we don't use gas chambers, but we use uh, the rate of, of infant mortality in order to uh, commit a genocide against uh, uh, the Palestinians. In reality, by the way, it's just the opposite. In reality, uh, just to, to uh, set things uh, straight, uh, infant mortality among Palestinians decreased dramatically from 67 up to now, every year less, which is uh, great. Which means that he published a blood libel. Can I define him as anti-Semite? He's Israeli, he's a Jew. I mean, I, I leave the question open. But this is what we are exposed to. And it's going on. Uh, Claire Short, she was uh, a cabinet uh, uh, member in, uh, the, the, in the cabinet of uh, uh, Tony Blair. And she wrote that the oppression of the Palestinian people is the major cause of violence in the world. I mean, millions were killed during the uh, last uh, uh, three, four decades from the foundation of Israel up to now millions. Israel has nothing to do with uh, 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 no one of them. The contribution of Israel to violence in the world, I calculated it, it's something like 0 0.00006, something like that, which means statistically zero. And yet, you see, an enlightened person, at least that's what she thinks about herself, claiming that we, the Jews in Israel, uh, uh, are the cause to, to violence. It's going on. She even blamed Israel in, uh, in the global warming. I have no idea what is the connection between Israel and the global warming. But when people are obsessed, that's uh, what uh, they say. And it's going on and on and on. Uh, we know about the story of uh, this journalist from the uh, CNN uh, 
who uh, said that um, that uh, uh, free, but he said uh, in the UN, uh, free Palestine from the river to the sea. Now, it's very interesting because the first one who uh, actually commented on, uh, on this uh, uh, Mark Lemont Hill uh, declaration was David Duke. And I guess David Duke, uh, you know him. He is uh, uh, white uh, supremacy, one of the leaders of uh, 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 white uh, uh, supremacy. And, and here he is. No decent person can disagree. But it's becoming worse even. In a, an academic uh, journal, uh, a professor published an article about the declaration of Lemont Hill, and he uh, wrote that the pro-Israel Zionist lobby dominate the US media and the whole of the uh, two major political parties. I guess it rings the bell. I mean, we are all aware to this kind of declarations coming generally from the extreme right. Now, can we distinguish between the extreme right and the extreme left? I don't know, because the same guy, uh, uh, David Duke, I mean, that's what he's saying again and again. The Jews dominate media. So we have to understand that, that if we are trying to distinguish between extreme right and extreme left, sometimes it's even impossible. And it's going on and on and on. How do you blame Israel? How do you put Israel as, as the, the main problem, just like what Claire showed, the minister from Britain did? This uh, Juan Cole, he was the president of MESA, Middle East Studies Association in the United States. And he published an article uh, uh, speaking about the official uh, uh, commission uh, about the 9-11, the Congress nominated uh, commission. And according to him, according to the 9-11 commission report, Al-Qaeda conceived the attack as response to the Israeli attack on Jenin. There is only one problem. First of all, it was never written. It's a blatant lie. It was never written in the uh, uh, report of, of uh, the official uh, report of the Congress. One. Second, I guess maybe some of you could see it. I mean, the story of uh, uh, Jenin was in 2002, and the 9-11 was in 2001. Blatant lie. And, um, I don't know if my time uh, is running out. Uh, yes, it is. It is. It is. OK, I, and if you want, I can stop here. But but we can uh, keep on and on and on with so many lies of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let me finish with the example of, uh, of uh, the most prominent intellectual. I mean, he was uh, chosen again and again to uh, the leading intellectual in the world. Uh, in, in the last debate about Israel as an apartheid state, he, I'm not going to show it to you because we don't have time. Uh, and he claimed, well, I have a proof that Israel is an apartheid state. How do I have a proof if black in the United States were excluded from 90% of the territory by a variety of laws, I would call it white supremacy. And then he compared it to Israel and claimed, look, Arabs are exclude, excluded from 90% of the territory. Uh, I guess all of you know that it's a blatant lie. And where was the problem? He had somebody next to him, a kind of pro-Israeli. He did not answer. And you know why he did not answer? Because he did not know basic facts, something which is happening again and again. And we are, we are defeated again and again. Uh, I could continue uh, uh, for hours. No, no, I think, I think uh, yeah. you made your point uh, very forcefully. Thank you, Bendro. We'll get to you uh, later. Uh, we'll, we're finished with the thank you. And uh, we are expecting uh, uh, Minister Shai to, uh, to join us. And let's see if he's on. Hopefully I'm here. Hi, Nachman. Uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to be with us. We, we appreciate it, we, knowing your uh, busy schedule. Uh, let me introduce you. Dr. Nachman Shai is our Minister of Diaspora Affairs. I uh, served uh, uh, as a member of the Knesset, representing the Labour Party, 
and has a number of positions in government, military, and media, including senior vice president, vice president, director general of the Jewish Federations of North America and Israel, director general of the Ministry of Science, Culture, and Sport, commander and editor in chief of Israel's Army Radio, and Israel's Defense Forces chief spokesperson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shai, for joining us. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, Uri, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very grateful to this opportunity uh, to address uh, such an impressive uh, group of uh, um, reporters and heads of organizations uh, hosted by uh, the, the, the Press Club, Jerusalem Class Press Club. Also to thank Carol, Danny, and uh, Ben Road. This is the order I see on my, uh, on my uh, computer screen. Uh, for um, um, taking part on this. I mean, uh, I'm also a participant, I'm, I'm not a host, but anyhow, I, I don't know how much time I have. I have a full presentation that may take uh, very long. So maybe I will just mention a few major points, uh, Uri, and then we'll open the forum for questions and answers. So I think that the, the principal uh, driving force uh, uh, at this stage when we are the eve of the Holocaust Remembers Day is to uh, take a look at the past year, uh, which will be uh, marked by, a, by the rise, by a spike, a very uh, a impressive one of, uh, of anti-Semitism due to two uh, major um, elements. One of them is the campaign, um, uh, the military campaign between, between or the military engagement between Israel and the Hamas in the summer of May 2221, and then the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, <clears throat> which uh, continued to uh, inspire conspiracy theories against Jews and classic anti-Semitism libels. So, libels. So two of them together contributed to this uh, spike that we uh, it came after around uh, three years that we witnessed a certain decline and suddenly anti-Semitism is back um, live and, and, and kicking. Uh, the the uh, rise in, in anti-Semitism is very disturbing. It calls for action. It cannot uh, remain uh, the same as um, I, I haven't heard all the, all, all the speakers, but I was I've just watched uh, my friend uh, Pedro Yamini's presentation and I fully agree with him and, and uh, the, 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 the direction where things where things are uh, going, um, the the way anti-Semitism uh, got a new form now of COVID-19 is also very very uh, disturbing. It seems like um, a lot of anti-Semite um, uh, groups and individuals just were waiting for another chance to inject anti-Semitism into the public uh, discourse, and now they got a new a, a new a new opportunity uh, using the the language of Holocaust. Uh, uh, just for uh, daily, uh, say the daily usage and travelization of the Holocaust uh, uh, discourse, or is 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 again something that we cannot uh, and we shouldn't uh, tolerate. And comparing between uh, uh, the Nazis and, and and concentration camps and so on and so forth. And in this in this celebration, also the Palestinians came and, and jumped in, bringing their own. Uh, uh, with their own uh, um, uh, campaign against Israel. Let's let's see this uh, uh, caricature, for example, uh, for a minute. I, I don't want to run the whole, uh, uh, but show you one of them, the COVID-48. COVID you see uh, COVID-48. Yeah, like this, you see, bringing together COVID-48. Uh, the, co the COVID uh, on the one hand, the Israel flag on the other hand. So. COVID-19 became COVID-48. This is just a, a selection of a few cricketers doing what I've just uh, described you uh, using um, 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 signs of, of the Holocaust and of the, um, of the Second World War uh, in this, uh, in this uh, context. Um, we, uh, the, the, the government of Israel and, and my ministry are monitoring uh, quite a number of social media networks. And I can uh, openly uh, tell you that this became uh, the major arena which we are engaged in. Uh, it's open, it's available, it's accessible. 
it's uh, inexpensive. So anti-Semite players of all kinds are using the social media in order to transmit or transfer their messages uh, for, the, for, for the entire world, literally. So uh, for example, we don't monitor all the, all the social media networks, but only some of them, but we can we pick up at least 3.5 million uh, messages in, in the past year uh, by 420,000 uh, users. That's a huge number. And also you can see on the right hand side, the map uh, which shows where the major uh, content or messages came from. And on, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, the rise of anti-Semitism during 2021. 20, 20, Mr. Shai, uh, Mr. Shai, uh, I hope that uh, people who are interested can get the slides later. Yes, okay. all, the slides, all, the, all, the, all the slides are available. I think it may make uh, a lot of sense. And if you just look at them, and I, I just want to save time, they are available at my office, and uh, I can provide them okay. to you as Thank well, you. and you can you can use them uh, for for any purpose. Um, one one point should be uh, mentioned in this context is is Europe, and there are two conflicting trends, and I would like to elaborate uh, on that. Uh, let's see that you see uh, on the one hand. We see uh, the, the, the European Union submitted historically, it's, a, it's quite an, an, an important development, uh, a, a plan, a strategic plan for the next decade, uh, uh, how to combat uh, anti Semitism, uh, uh, very detailed plan, I should say. But on the other hand, in the same, and also the, the second goal, the run of combat and, center, and foster Jewish life in Europe. Europe, since 1939 up until today, lost. 8 million Jews, because in the, at the eve of the Second World, 9.5 million Jews were living in Europe, now just eight. Well, there are many, many other reasons, not necessarily the Holocaust, but of course the major portion of Jewish population was uh, exterminated during the Second World War, during, during the Holocaust. So Europe would like the Jews to live peacefully, hopefully Jewishly in Europe, but it doesn't uh, fit to the other direction, which means uh, what, what the, the, quite a number of uh, restrictions uh, uh, by at least two states so far, Greece and, and, and Belgium, and maybe more to come on, on kashrut, on, on, on shchita, on slaughtering. Uh, that's the way we keep our kashrut, uh, whatever your opinion is, it doesn't matter. This is, this is, this is Jewish, this is the way Jewish, uh, uh, this is the way of Jewish life, Jewish tradition. Uh, the next uh, probably will be circumcision. So you cannot on the one hand say that we would like to foster Jewish life in Europe and encourage Jew Jews to live in Europe. On the other hand, you um, present quite a number of barriers for them to, to live a Jew full Jewish uh, life. Uh, I would say also that uh, our ministry uh, is involved in, in a number of uh, op operations, both uh, in Europe and the United States, but mainly in Europe, and elsewhere uh, uh, of uh, fortifying Jewish targets, cemeteries, uh, uh, um, um, synagogues, uh, 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 ch ch children, uh, kindergarten, schools, uh, Jewish community centers, and so on. Uh, hundreds of them were already fortified and more to come. We all allocate uh, quite a number uh, of millions of, of, of shekels for that purpose. Uh, we believe this is our responsibility and we have to help them. We don't do it uh, in the United States where the Jewish community there decided to allocate one, $126 million uh, for the next three years from their own resources just for uh, protecting the federation uh, system there. It's, it's a lot of money. And uh, we are going to uh, help them by advising uh, how to handle emergency situation as the, the one in Colleyville uh, last week or the week before last and similar ones, which unfortunately happened in the United States. Uh, we don't have to provide them with any financial sources, resources, but we do have to, and we, we would share our own experience how to handle uh, emergencies. And we do other things as well. And if you want to go into this, it's part of our general responsibility for Jewish communities, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, uh, 
uh, the, the uh, federations all around the world, 8 million Jews living out of the country. This is my ministry's responsibility and this is the government of Israel responsibility. Uh, uh, I can elaborate more and more, but I think I'll stop here and, and we all have to take- uh, Thank uh, you. Questions. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick uh, follow up and I appreciate a very brief answer. Uh, Aren't we Israelis too quick to pull the anti-Semitic card when it comes to criticism of Israel? Um, yes, sometimes I agree with you. I said that's why I made it very clear. Even in the IRA, uh, fam the IRA uh, new definition of anti-Semitism, it says very openly that criti criticizing Israel is not anti-Semitism. I think we all share the same uh, position here, Bendror. Danny and, and Carol, I, I accept criticism. I'm ready to argue with anyone, anywhere, anytime. And uh, criticism is absolutely legitimate, but in many cases, it goes beyond criticism when it delegitimizes the state of Israel or the de demonized uh, the Jewish people and so on and so forth, or the double standards. It's the three famous Ds of, of Nathan Sharansky when and it charges Israel with the double standards. We expect the Jews we expect more from you Jews and so on and so forth. This is kind of anti-Semitism. So yes, criticism is fine and I, and I welcome it even, uh, but on the other hand, not every criticism is, is uh, not every criticism is anti-Semitism, not every. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Dayan, uh, you spoke before as a, under your hat as the Consul General in New York. I bring you back to the other hat of, uh, head of Yad Vashem, and the question is with uh, uh, with social media where everybody actually can say whatever they want, uh, has it become even more difficult to monitor and combat anti-Semitism? Well, again, uh, uh, if you talk with me as the head of uh, Yad Vashem, we do not monitor anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, it's not our responsibility. It's not the thing that we are uh, in charge of and we do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are uh, deeply aware of a different form of, uh, I don't know, some, some manifestations of it are anti-Semitic and some are not. I would like to explain what I mean. Uh, the good news Uri, is that uh, uh, Holocaust denial, outright Holocaust denial, which is a form of anti-Semitism, even according to the definition of IRA of anti-Semitism, um, is marginal today. Uh, if, of course, you can find Holocaust denial in the lunatic fringes of the social media because you can find anything in the lunatic fringes of the social media. But, you know, today, no respected world leader, uh, journalist, intellectual, influencer, artist will say that uh, the Holocaust didn't happen or uh, uh, there were no, no gas chambers or millions of Jews were not murdered by the Nazis. That doesn't exist except, except for perhaps in Iran or, or, or some other uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalist uh, uh, groups. But we see a very, very disturbing and very dangerous uh, uh, phenomenon, and that is Holocaust distortion. And the problem with Holocaust distortion these days is that it's done, uh, is uh, well funded, because it's done mainly by governments, by governments, and or in other cases by uh, very strong social, political, social or political groups. The ways that the Holocaust distortion manifests itself is, uh, for instance, countries that say, uh, of course, the Holocaust happened, and of course, that there were extermination camps, but my, the citizens of my country, all of them were righteous among the nations. All of them helped, no, no one of them helped the Nazis, collaborated with the Nazis. Unfortunately, we know that that is historically untrue in every single country that was under Nazi occupation or influence, uh, there were uh, large numbers of collaborators. Uh, the other thing that we see, it happened uh, lately uh, in one of the former Soviet republics, uh, legislation that uh, says the Holocaust, the genocide was not against the Jews, was because they were citizens of our country. 
Um, well, that also is a, a fallacy. Uh, there was a complete different uh, uh, treatment of Jews and the other uh, uh, citizens of that uh, specific country. And even in Western Europe, we see these days a candidate for president in a certain Western European country, not a small one, a Jew in this case, that uh, uh, says that the uh, 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 Nazi uh, influenced uh, uh, government of his country helped the Jews, uh, while we know that the historical truth is uh, completely the opposite. Uh, that is very troublesome because in some senses it's more annoying and more uh, dangerous than untrout uh, Holocaust denial. Because, you know, Holocaust denial is very easy to, to rebut. Uh, in these cases, which are based in a very uh, cherry-picked uh, 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 events, uh, that you need knowledge in order to uh, rebut that. And uh, that's definitely the task of Yad Vashem. We are deeply engaged with that. And the other thing, obviously, that you see also as very troubling, very annoying, and unfortunately it happens even in Israel, is the Holocaust trivialization. Uh, we see it rampant these days uh, with uh, comparisons between uh, COVID, uh, uh, between uh, what we here in Israel we call the Green Pass, in other countries had different names, and the, the Yellow Star uh, comparison, outrageous comparisons between a, a medical uh, expert like Dr. Fauci to, the, uh, uh, to Mengele um, and uh, things like that. That too is a thing that we should not, under any circumstances, uh, let uh, flourish and we have to confront uh, forcibly and immediately and convincingly. Okay, uh, we gathered a few questions from journalists uh, abroad. And Carol, the question is, uh, how dangerous it is really? I mean, what is the, is there a linkage between something running in uh, social media or in the, or in the classical media uh, and actually happening on the streets or in a synagogue? Is there a direct linkage between the two? Definitely. What is the role, what is the role of, of the media, of the of of uh, the social media and general media in uh, in um, uh, inflating this phenomena. So definitely, we believe that words leads to deeds, and 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 dangerous word uh, words lead to dangerous deeds. And we saw that just last week in Texas, as I mentioned, the hostage taker held a conspiracy theory, and this is why he chose his um, target very, very carefully. And that could have been a disaster. Thank God the outcome is okay, but that was a very traumatic event. So we have to understand what, um, what beliefs do. We call it in ADL, we call it the pyramid of hate. So it starts with stereotypes. And then because you stereotype some, somebody, you can have prejudice about the group. And when you have prejudice, you can discriminate because it's legitimate to discriminate against somebody you think is just, you know, have um, some features that you don't think are, you know, at your, your level. And after that, you can, after discrimination comes violence and after violence comes extreme violence in the, in, you know, in a genocidal sense and so on. So it doesn't necessarily go, you know, at, you know, every level up, but we as ADL have been um, challenged along the years with intervening at every stage of this pyramid of hate. So words lead to this. The, um, I think that, you know, I, I do want to relate to something Minister Shai mentioned, which is, um, and, and that really, um, we see that a lot on social media, is really where the problem lays. I think we all agree that anti classic anti-Semitism per se has to be denounced, and that anti-Israel expression are totally legitimate. That's for sure, we all agree with that. But I think that there's a gray area and it's becoming much more sophisticated, which is not anti-Semitism per se, but it's also not, not pure anti-Israel expression, pure anti-Israel criticism. And this is a very, very dangerous area which enables anti-Semitism, which creates a fertile ground for anti-Semitic expressions. And those are all of the, 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 the 
you know, the use of words like apartheid, settler colonialist, ethnic cleansing, genocidal policies, and so on, when relating to the state of Israel. And in that respect, I do want to say that, you know, anti-Semitism coming from the right is very, very dangerous. Sometimes it's, it's militaristic, existential, and so on. That's for sure, and that's dangerous. But I think that giving legitimacy, normalizing the discourse about Israel in such a way is also a very, very big danger. Because when you say that Israel is a settler colonialist, when you use words like apartheid, and when you use tactics like BDS, which is inspired by South African apartheid and so on, you legitimate a certain violent wording against Israel, which is totally unacceptable. And we see that a lot on social media. And I think that this is why we have to educate social media platform to understand the very, very hidden piece of anti-Semitism anti that we understand. But I think that um, to these days, um, this is still legitimate on social media. Thank you. Ben Remini, uh, you seem like uh, a lone wolf in, 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 in the map of the Israeli uh, classical media, uh, newspapers, television, etc. Like uh, you're the only one who cares about this. I mean, what 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 happens in the Israeli media regarding this issue, and what is your expectation of your colleagues and and maybe of of journalists at large? Uh, well, I could uh, take it as a compliment, but I'm not. I'm not because first of all, um, I think that there are so many decent uh, journalists, uh, and uh, as we all know, uh, it's becoming just like um, what is your expertise? I mean, some journalists speak about uh, about some subjects, and that's their expertise, and some others do not. Uh, I think that that um, my research and my work and my kind of journalism, it's coming out of of uh, being exposed. To, to the things that um, I spoke about and the things that I'm doing. I mean, uh, I'm interested because in a way, yes, there is ben a problem. Lord, sorry for that. Uh, Mr. Dayan warned us he needs to leave at uh, uh, 6 at 25. So thank you very much for being with us. And anybody who wants to be in touch uh, through, and thank you, Iris Rosenberg, uh, for facilitating it. Uh, thank you, Danny, and Ben. Thank Lopez. you. See you next time. So um, anyway, I don't. I, but but anyway, I don't think that I'm uh, alone. There are many journalists. Uh, I am just coming uh, uh, from two uh, conferences. The two of them uh, uh, were in the Bay Area, and um, and I see a lot of. Uh, they are not the majority. They are, in the, they are the, the minority. But journalists in the U.S. dealing with the subject. They are aware, they are fighting. I'm not at all, uh, uh, I don't feel at all alone uh, because I read also them. I read them and I know that there is a, a huge struggle and I guess that uh, Minister uh, Shai uh, can speak about it, about the so many organizations, uh, pro-Israeli uh, organizations. The main problem, the main problem, if I may say it, that many of them, they are pro-Israelis, they are pro-Israelis, but many of them are not aware to basic facts concerning Israel, concerning, for example, something that, that you don't have to be anti-Semite in order to speak about it, about Israel has a right to defend itself, but Israel is killing uh, innocent civilians uh, in a very disproportionate way. They don't know what they are talking about. Again, the apartheid, uh, uh, the apartheid uh, uh, story, which they don't know the realities in Israel. They don't understand and so on and so on. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And, and but I don't feel at all alone. I don't feel alone. And I, I just want to hope that something is going to change, uh, but I'm not sure about it. I'm not that optimistic. Okay, uh, Minister Shai, uh, we need to let you go as well, but uh, just uh, wrap up the the, the uh, discussion with the with the thought and I have a question that came in from a journalist in the states uh, Israel seems to be uh, to show solidarity with the Jewish communities mainly when there is a crisis what about showing solidarity 
in normal times. Uh, first of all, uh, when, when, when our friends are in trouble, we come, we should come and, and, and help. Uh, we did that only a few months ago when I was dispatched to uh, Southside uh, Miami uh, to uh, stand uh, next to uh, and hug and embrace uh, Jews in the Jewish community there when they lost uh, 40%, 40 uh, members of their community when this uh, big tower collapsed. And uh, this was an opportunity to show the solidarity between us and, and American, uh, uh, American Jewish community. Uh, but we are there uh, and they are here all the time in, in peace and, and in, in at war at any time. Uh, we are working uh, very um, uh, in, in intensively now in American uh, campus, on American campuses. We work uh, with on, on, uh, teenagers in high schools in, in America. We do all kinds of projects uh, that's supposed to uh, help American uh, Jewish education and to strengthen the relationship between American Jewry and Israel without war, without emergency, without uh, anti-Semitism, just because we believe that there is one and only one Jewish people all around the world. And we, uh, we should be as close as possible to each other. Uh, what happens, for example, in, in, in Ukraine, between Russia and, and, and Ukraine right now, also impacts Jewish life. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews living both in Ukraine and in Russia, and we care very much for them. It doesn't mean that we don't understand the international uh, game here and the, uh, the, all the powers concerned, but we, we, we have special uh, attachment, which is quite understandable between Jews. And when something like that happens or may happen, uh, we extend our hands and we say, uh, we are here to help. It applies to Europe, it applies to America, it applies to every single Jew all around the world. This is our responsibility as the Jewish state. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the speakers, uh, Minister Shai. Uh, thank Zion. you very much, Uria. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a great opportunity and you did a very good job as usual. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ben Royemini, Carol Noel of ADL. Thanks uh, to our, my colleagues at JPC, Talia Dekel and Eli Klutstein, who made this uh, webinar possible and uh, stay tuned to our next event. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.